Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to those who made it here personally, and also special welcome to those who joined us via Zoom. It's a great pleasure to see you here, those diehards who overlived the previous lecture and who are still curious about what we have to show. Today is going to be a lecture about statistical physics. What happens when we are talking not about small things, what happens if we're talking about many things? Would be a lot of uh, exciting phenomena. Dima is going to talk about it. Uh, before I give a word to him, I should ask you first if you haven't, uh, for some reason, visit, visit our web page, please do. Here's a QR code and uh, the address below. And uh, also, uh, if you come to these lectures and you enjoy, uh, share it with friends. You will help us a lot. We are appreciating uh, people who are coming to us. Now, uh, Dima, please. Hello, everyone. They have very nice magic device, which will allow to me to use mouse by pointing on that screen there. So it's examples of usage of signs. Today we are going to speak about uh, statistical physics. And if last time I spoke about some old movies, I have still to press mouse here. Let me check. Yes, now it works. So this time I will go speak about some old computer games. So this is a game from 1994. It's the one which I played when I was uh, in school, actually. And this is Warcraft 1. It's a real-time strategy. Uh, but by modern standard, standard graphics is not perfect. So I decided to go and update graphics and it, uh, uh, looked in the heritage of, of, of Blizzard game, World of Warcraft, which you know much better. So in this game, you can find four characters, which are called fire elemental, water elemental, earth elemental, and air elementals. And uh, Warcraft Wiki gives very illuminating definition. Fire elementals are elemental creatures made of fire elements. I mean, it's super nice example of self recursion uh, Anyway, we do not, I really do not understand what this phrase means, but uh, I kind of understand why they have these creatures. Uh, and actually, the, uh, the idea of these creatures or elemental things go much, 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 much older than the game itself. Actually, it comes at least to ancient Greece. Uh, uh, the word element was defined in Greece, and Aristotle wrote the following that element is a body into which other bodies may be analyzed, and, and this body itself not divisible into smaller parts. Uh, well, when we say the word elementary, it comes from ancient Greece. It means something small as possible. Uh, well, we have, for instance, chemical elements. If you use any energies of uh, chemical reactions, but then they're not elementary if you go to nuclear reactions and so on. And eventually we come to elementary particles, uh, which is the best we can do on modern experiments. And uh, this will be subject of lecture number four, which is about uh, quantum field theory and uh, search for Higgs boson. But today, uh, we actually still in ancient Greece, and the ancient Greeks believed that there are four basic elements, which is fire, air, water, and earth. Well, some of them said this actually was a fifth element to describe things in the sky. We advanced a lot of science, and these days we will know how fifth element looks like. And this fifth element actually has a multi passport. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Greek culture made a big, uh, the same story was in other cultures, not the same, but similar. And uh, uh, it was a big impact to, to, to modern, not modern, but uh, science is this, even 200 years ago, it was a big impact. Uh, people still uh, were using this idea of uh, four elements with similar. And uh, they actually didn't believe much in atoms uh, until like 150 years ago. And to convince that atom to exist was difficult. Well, it's kind of psychologically understandable why. 
because if you look on these four uh, uh, states of matter, believe to believe that these things uh, is a, a is coming from organization of something unique, but just organized differently, it's very hard. Well, these days we know that organized by water, it can be liquid, uh, solid, gas, and uh, plasma form. But again, uh, I'm not honest with you. Uh, because uh, gas form of water is invisible. I cannot do any picture really like this. This is actually water droplets. And uh, also, well, fire is definitely not a water molecule, right? It's actually burning of something into something else. So this is example of plasma. I took it from uh, uh, Wiki and the claim that it's actually water vapor passing through the nozzle at very high temperature. So it's probably plasma created from originally water molecules which I dissociated now. Anyway, these days we know that uh, kind of atoms organized in different forms are responsible for different states of matter. Uh, but it was not uh, so long ago that people could hardly believe in this. Uh, and actually, uh, Johannes Dedrick van der Waals uh, got a Nobel Prize in 1910 for his work uh, 30 years before exactly to show a mathematical model when we can use atomic structure and certain uh, modeling and show phase transition between water and gas. It was very important advancement in uh, conceptual sort of science. And we also understand why humanity was so resistant because we have this strange idea, uh, which I explained last time a lot, if you look like uh, humans, we believe that everything else looks like humans, just, just smaller. And it will be just very small, tiny humans here and probably something uh, bigger planets on top. But nature is much more surprising to us. And we know that uh, on small scale things are very different and believe that elements are just the same as uh, like big things, just small, uh, it is, is completely wrong. Last time we speak, spoke about small elements. Today, actually, we will not insist on small any longer. I will insist on something different. I will insist on having many things at the same time. And by the way, this many doesn't mean they are small. They should be small just for the reason that we have to fit them in some volume to have it many. But otherwise, I do not insist that they are small in any way. OK. And this is a lot of statistical physics. And like here, we had to break our intuition. Here, we also have to accept different rules of game compared to the rules of game we play uh, on normal scales. And this will be our second adventure uh, in, that, uh, in the course of adventures with the laws of nature. Today I will introduce rules of game in like a negation form, what you should not expect. First thing you should not expect when the system has too many components that you should not expect being capable to follow each component in detail. It is still be pointless. Uh, now we are going to play a game. I will make a point why it's pointless. Uh, so I have some file here. Go to Mathematica. Let's check if it works. So this is hard sphere models. It contains only 12 particles and these particles will move around. Uh, clearly see them. Now the game starts and the game is the following. You have to focus on the red particle, how it moves. But what I'm going to do now I'm going to switch off the color of the red particle and you still have to follow it, okay? When I count to three, I will switch off color red, but it still follows the particle. And after a few seconds, I will uh, make it red again. So one, two, three. So raise your hand who did it. Yeah, good. Okay, 
but this is was like preliminary game because now we are going to have three particles. And when I count to three, I will again um, take away colors. One, two, three. Yeah, who did it? Still good. Very nice job. But now we have finals. You have five particles. Okay, so uh, do you see them? Okay, very good, you see them. So I start the uh, count. One, two, three. So any luck? So young generation uh, claims they have good eyes. Um, well, I mean, sometimes you will be lucky to get five particles right, but of course you're probably aware number of particles that exist in, in, in uh, matter around us, it's even not 10 and not even 100. So uh, I hope it convinces you well that it's very pointless to try to follow things. Now, this is some model of gas. Now, you can say that we are poor humans that cannot do a lot of things at the same time. And our, our perception is limited. Let us use computers or whatever nice machinery that we have to follow many things at the same time. Well, we are going to discuss whether it's possible, but indeed people use machinery to advance their capacities. But then it's a second uh, problem that comes when we have too many components, it's very likely that we are going to be in state of deterministic chaos. And now I have a question to people. Uh, in, in, in science, it's very important that we define clearly what do we speak about? Actually, it's also important in life. If people use a word, but uh, do not understand the meaning of the word, it leads to trouble. So now uh, think a little bit in your head what do you understand when you hear the word cows? Well, I actually decided to use modern approach. I Googled. Actually, almost all the talk was based on Googling what I expect to find. Uh, and this is interesting how life works these days. Anyway, first of all, uh, I decided to look for uh, word bubbles and found two websites, decided to pick one. Uh, so, so here, uh, cows in the center. And what people think about this? Well, it's kind of interesting because the word anarchism, anarchy was twice, but also politics and uh, uh, where it was somewhere else. Political, so the word anarchia politics were twice mentioned. So it's kind of interesting association. Then it was rebellion, physics, and also periodicity and disorder. So this is what people think about cows on this website. Uh, they definitely make a choice by themselves, I believe. It's my belief. But then I asked Google and asked for imaging. So this is images of cows uh, offered by Google. So we will speak about this a lot. But funny thing is this one. Do you know what is this one? Uh, it's interesting what is it in here. It's, you cannot see it. It is cows elemental. So I just had uh, deja vu. And you also have, have an office uh, cows. Then I ask Yahoo. So Yahoo actually offered much more appealing visually images. And so if you want nice picture, probably have to go there. But the funny part is this one. Cows free delivery from 239 chronos. Yeah. So it was an interesting perception uh, of cows as well. Um, right. Anyway, uh, then we go to the dictionary and uh, check the first definition. So, normal understanding of cows is it's a state of utter confusion and also confused mass or mixture. This is what people usually think about cows. 
But there is also another definition they have, and this one actually works for physics. It's inherent unpredictability in the behavior of a complex natural, uh, natural system. Well, in reality, the more important word here, unpredictability. I must tell you, the system is not obliged to be too complex. It can be quite simple, but still unpredictable, and we are going to see it. But this is a key word. You cannot predict what's going to happen if system is chaotic. And now uh, the most confusing is what deterministic. Deterministic actually means that everything is predetermined, so destined to be something concrete, but yet we cannot predict the destiny. So it's again a little bit counterintuitive, but uh, what you speak about is actually deterministic cause. Well, uh, again, so Googling helps and I do not need to type much. Uh, the, fam the most famous example that everybody sees when does different type of studies here in the work house, dynamical system and so on is Lorentz attractor. So Lorentz was predicting weather and he was trying to find simple equation to describe atmospheric convection. He found three variables that is find three first order differential equation. So by modern start is, is extremely simple system. It's just three components. And it was 19, uh, 1963, uh, which means computers were there, but kind of very bad computers and they definitely wanted to simplify. So these days people will not probably even notice that this is possible. And this is what comes out and this picture is everywhere when you ask for cows. But what's the point? So you're going to solve these three equations and uh, here I have a movie uh, solved on Mathematica. So first of all, uh, I want to, uh, to see what this uh, three-dimensional trajectory by solution of the equation looks like. So the point which I want to make, the trajectory looks, looks strange. It's un quite unusual. It's called Lorentz attractor, but it's fully determined if you know initial conditions. So this is an important point. If you fix initial conditions, you in principle, by doing very precise computation, you can you, you predict exactly what will happen. And well, this is what is happening. Uh, it's a simulation from Mathematica. But now uh, I ask myself the question, how good is my prediction? Uh, because uh, uh, in reality, we never can do precise uh, measurement. So there will be always small mistake in measurement. And I, I, I generated two, uh, two, particles whose coordinate position differs in the fifth digits after comma, almost in six. So it's one per million. So one per million, you have to understand something. So I'm one meter, I'm one meter, one micron is 10 to the power minus six is the size of a, of, of a cell in my body. So I displaced position of my finger or point particle by distance of one cell, I, I definitely, it's, it's extremely small displacement. That's what I did uh, with this system. And now I asked how ev evolution goes uh, this time. So we'll be two particles, uh, blue and yellow. Uh, I hope you can see it. So there is some bluish and yellowish. They're very close, so they're kind of overlapping. Uh, and here there is tiny thing, it's time. So 15 seconds passed, and after 15 seconds, the history completely departed. So in reality, even though it made this very, very small deviation in initial conditions, after 15 seconds of evolution, I'm not able to control what is happening. I have no predictive power. So I did it also more scientifically, not in pictures, but scientifically. I uh, plotted, um, Does it work only with PowerPoint? Oh, it's this one. Yeah, uh, right. So what I did, uh, this is time of evolution. And this is number of position of the digits where two coordinates differ. So we started for almost six position difference. So we see this time number of digits, digits which, uh, at which they differ decreases until the reach point that it becomes uh, before decimal, before Coma, and then it's becoming apart and distinct. So during 10 seconds, uh, precision dropped by three orders of magnitude. So every, 
every three seconds one of those magnitude to drop. And then you say, okay, I say, okay, let me give me eight digits correct, eight digits, eight times three, 24. So let's say after 25 seconds, I still have no control. So I work very hard to get eight digits, really hard. It's super, very difficult experiment, but it only gives me 25 seconds uh, to control the system. So this is an example of system that is determined, but at the same time chaotic because you cannot control the long distance. So this is a typical example. But now we come back to Lawrence, who was predicting weather. So Lawrence told us that it's very hard to predict weather. It's chaotic, what people are doing. Uh, so these days, people organize across the world. And there is a site which is European Center of Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Uh, I looked through the sites a little bit to prepare the lecture. Uh, so they actually uh, collaborations with the whole world. They collect data so the, from the whole planet, assemble, assemble it together, and do very complicated computations. Uh, they have more than 300 uh, people staff that are doing computation. Most of them sitting in Reading near London, but organization is international. And uh, well, they, what they do is they predict weather. Actually. I was amazed how complicated what they're doing. I don't think that they're just uh, modeling how uh, clouds propagate in the sky. They're actually simulating how the rain falls down. They're simulating, uh, they take all the water surface on the earth, including glaciers and just normal lakes and rivers, and they simulate how much water evaporates. They, they actually compute uh, local albedo, its reflection uh, capacity of earth, to, uh, they go to like basically to upper layers of atmosphere and all this together is like, I mean, just they have like one page list of all the programs they're using together. They have their own supercomputer and it's uh, so uh, as if it did, they got to try it, they have between nine and 15 kilometer uh, precision points across the whole globe now these days. So it's a super big thing. Okay, but what they can do uh, and uh, they have their own batch, benchmark uh, analysis. Benchmark analysis is uh, actually a uh, uh, height above the water surface when we have half of atmospheric uh, pressure. I think it's 500, I think it's two hectopascal. It is half of atmosphere, one atmosphere. So on the surface of force is roughly one atmosphere, it is half of it. So it's somewhere high in the sky. And the altitude that which has happened is called um, this, uh, uh, well, geopotential height. Now they compute correlation coefficient. This is a standard definition of, from probability theory between uh, their prediction and actual height when uh, half of atmosphere uh, goes away. And if, uh, so the law of the following, if it's bigger than 0 0.6, so above 60 percent here, then it's actually great prediction. So it's not 60% chance of, of water drop. It's 0 0.6 correlation coefficient between that particular quantity. So if you're there, you have, you have good prediction. Uh, so uh, 40 years ago, uh, before, uh, the spin corresponds to five-day prediction. So we was able to predict it five days. Now, if you look, uh, this went actually to 92%, 0 0.92 correlation function. And uh, well, uh, 10 day, so this yellow is 10 day predictions. I'm not there yet, but I would say nine days should be there. So, uh, all in all, uh, each 10 years, they get one more day. For 10 years of research effort and improvement of technology, with all, uh, all the exponential loads of transistor growing, with all the satellites, I mean, you know, we have revolutions now in the computing technology. 10 years of this revolution for the past 40 years, 10 years means one day of better prediction for the weather. Well, it's great actually, it's, it's, it's serious. Uh, uh, yeah, so currently we, we reach nine day uh, horizon of, of predictivity in average across the earth. This is current status. So you can imagine how complicated it is. This is exactly what I'm trying to tell you, okay. They have super, they're not, not using human power, they use super machines these days, but okay, they have the clear limitations of predictivity. Before we go further, 
uh, I need to make two comments. The first one about quantum mechanics. All I discussed until now was classical system, classical equations of motion, everything was classical. Uh, it was to mention quantum mechanics because uh, I was trying to explain last time that the quantum mechanics, at least as how we understand it these days, there is inherent randomness. Well, people debating this because randomness comes at the moment of measurement and measurement is a tricky point because well, we kind of also quantum, but classical, well, who knows? But anyway, uh, in quantum mechanics, it seems that chaos is non-deterministic, it's real. But regardless, for statistical physics, we do not require all this quantum stuff. We can be completely classical and deterministic and still be coward. So be very clear about this. Quantum effects can be there, can be not there, doesn't matter. The result is the same, we have cows. And second thing, after all this weather prediction story, uh, I mean, you kind of start to feel that prediction of future is practically impossible. So if you go to this, uh, uh, people who kind of speak, uh, say to speak with spirits, I mean, okay, even spirits are there, okay. Let's say spirits are there, they can speak to spirits. I mean, spirits will have the same problems that we have. I mean, you see, I mean, even they will, I, I don't believe they could predict. So, so be, be cautious, cautious. It's not because spirits do not exist. I do not claim this. I claim that spirits won't be able also to, right? Of course, I'm joking. But anyway, uh, this is a point. Uh, future is hard to predict. And then, of course, question comes uh, about his, should we read history to not make the same mistakes in the future? Well, of course, here we speak about precise prediction of future. When we come to human, uh, there is a question about will and uh, stable behavior. It's not the same. So not, 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 not every system necessarily chaotic in the way I describe it. When it comes to human, things are more difficult. And there is question of will and determination, which can overcome ca chaotic part. And there is there is there are lessons in history which are, which are still useful, um, which unfortunately we do not uh, study until we should, well until it's a little bit too late. Um, okay, so I explain you about cows. Uh, so our negative. Summary: We cannot cont we cannot follow because we are humans. But if even we can, uh, we do not have control in the long term. We have deterministic cows. Well, if you find in yourself situation, uh, welcome to statistical physics. Here we are. So we have to live in statistical physics with this reality. But now it's a very good attitude in life. You have to always make your weakness into your strengths. The moment you accept your, it's your weakness, it becomes a strength, and you should understand what, what is possible to do. Um, the, the moment you accept this reality, which is uh, very uh, interesting, uh, you start thinking what can you do, and you can. And the most important part is loss of no, numbers. So actually put here uh, laws, this means are many laws, uh, but this one, which is the most important one, it's the only one we should actually speak about very clearly today. The others, it requires more, more mathematics. But this one is nice one. The simplest one is this one, that if you have sequence of uncorrelated, this is the word here, events, then the result will start to sum up into normal distribution. Uh, most likely many of you heard about this already. But again, we have simulated on the computer to see how it works. So uh, this is uh, one simulation here. It's about tossing coin. This is the most classical example. If you have uh, heads, you have heads and tail in coin. Let's say heads cost give you one point and tails give you zero. So if you have only one coin, oh, is it is it me? Okay, I will sit. Okay. So you have only one coin, you have one half probability. Ah. 
Okay, uh, you have one half probability. Uh, oh, it's actually me on computer when I was registering this video. Okay, uh, this, is, this is a tricky part. Uh, so it's one half probability to have heads, one half probability to have tails. But what if you have two coins? Well, there will be one quarter probability to have two heads, one quarter probability to have two tails, and one half probability to have one head and one head. The next one will be three coins, and this is uh, so distribution, then it will be, uh, then I start to play the video. But I want to show you uh, one, one thing which is, uh, you should recognize. So this is famous Pascal trian uh, triangle, and this is a binomial distribution number. That's exactly how you compute probabilities. Now, a little bit uh, rusty on the Z history because it's uh, probably exists on Google, but I read it in the book, and I'm not as good as Googling remembering what I read ten years ago. But the story is far as follows: So Pascal, as himself or his friend, were gambling. Uh, and they had to find a way to win. And that's why Pascal uh, was developing this. It was very practical sort of application in the past. So, so it's, it's kind of, you know, you, it's like today we have companies that gives grants to scientists uh, to develop science to get money. So it was grant to develop probability theory by Pascal in the past. Because at the, at the time of Pascal, people actually believed that there is some providence uh, helping to win the dice game. And Pascal found the way to win it statistically by developing this story. Uh, anyway, so uh, if you do, uh, throw dice many times, uh, uh, that after uh, like say 100 throws, you will have this nice distribution, uh, which is highly uh, controllable. You actually have a big peak around one half, right? And very narrow thing. You may think that it's related to dice, or not dice, sorry, a coin, because it's heads and tail very symmetric. But then I just, uh, for fun, took very random distribution. So it's from minus one to one, you have 12 different coins. It's very different probability for them to happen. And then run experiment again. So this is not my mouse, it's here, it's my mouse in the recording. So it takes 15 uh, events to clearly again see Gaussian, even original distribution was crazy in the unsymmetric. So it's not about original distribution, whatever we have originally, it doesn't matter. At the end, you'll have Gauss if things are non-correlated. And this is the point, the message I want to give you. And what it gives for you is the message at the very end, is that you need to know only two numbers, average value, which were the peak, and uh, sigma, which is called mean square de deviation. And also the fact that the more you have experiments, the smaller sigma is. So the more narrow is the speak. And this thing is used, not by us, but by, 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 by big players in this world. So uh, those who can play the game many times and have positive expectation value will win. This is a basic statement from statistics. Uh, so uh, uh, the point that in, in this roulette, there are 37 uh, slots. There are 18 reds, uh, uh, 18 black and one zero. So let's say black and red compensate win and loss, but zero it's for, uh, for cousin. It's uh, average value of win is one over 37. So if you want player, you play one time, you have like a dice. So you have one half to win and one half, one half to win and one half to lose. It is always one half. It is actually um, 19 over 37 to lose and 18 over 37 to win. But if you look at this picture, it's also not very nicely drawn. You kind of cannot fail to see the difference. You play twice, it also looks very symmetric. You play 10 times, well, it looks slightly skewed already, but you know, you still have good chances and you keep playing, right? And this is what Casino solves. After 500 times of play, Casino has clear peak to the right of zero. And it's already clearly winning. 
if you multiply it by thousand, of course, by hundred, then this width will be 10 times more narrow. It means sure wind flow cousin. So this example you probably heard a lot. And actually, when I went to Can I went to Niagara Falls and there was a lot of casinos. I did not play casinos, I know why I didn't play casinos. But the, on the entrance of every casino, they had big letters. On average, you will lose. They actually tell people before coming that it's just for fun. You should not expect to win. Uh, this you probably know from different reasons. But this is something you probably less know is betting on sport. So uh, it was from this morning and to, I took William Hill coefficients for outcomes of English Premier League games. There will be four games. They're happening, they finish by now or will happen like happening now. Uh, so there are four games and the coefficients uh, for, for, instance, for Arsenal to win, for to be the draw in the game and Leeds to win. Uh, now let's do a little bit of numerology. Let's uh, take this coefficient, take one over it, plus one over this coefficient, plus one over the coefficient, sum together. Surprise, it will be one, but not one, but one zero four. Let's repeat the game again. So the story is the following. Uh, you can guess. William Hill earns 4% of profit per each bet on average. This is the outcome. It's a little bit better than casino. First of all, you know it and they declare it. Not, not, not on the first line of their website, but you can find it. Uh, and they also, you, now you know how to compute. You take a sum of inverses and, it, and everything after is zero. So obviously it will be smaller than one, then you bet, you bet immediately. I mean, you will, you will win on average, right? But here you will, uh, on average, you lose four percent. But there is something fair here, a little bit fair, because maybe they are wrong in their estimation of probability, because this is basically probabilities for events to happen, they are estimates of William Hill. Maybe they are wrong. They, could have been wrong and you're a very clever uh, predictor of football outcome and you will be right and then you can win. The only problem, they have specialists whose their sole job for the whole life to predict games as, as, bad, as good as they can. And you know, the, the truth, a professional does a job always better than a non-professional. And so they win still. There's a lot of money. And you know, we have uh, these statistics uh, websites these days, with all the analysis, there's so many numbers to draw from. And you know what is so much money has become honestly ridiculous. Uh, Manchester City annual defense exceeds uh, the actual military defense of 55 actual countries, 52 countries. It's from 2018. So cost of defense line of Manchester City is more than cost of armed forces in quite a few countries in this world. And well, this is actually probably a little bit sad, uh, but because of this huge money, we have all these statistics and uh, statistics allows you to win if you play uh, a lot. It's not only about football. Uh, there was a book Moneyball and TV film uh, with Brad Pitt called Moneyball about, it's quite fun film. It's about uh, how you can win by baseball games by doing correct statistical and not making uh, risky movements. So uh, if you're interested, you can you either entertain yourself or make it more serious and read the book. So now this example from life and we have another example from light. Can we use statistics to check whether elections are falsified? Well, yes, and there are articles about this on archive. Oh, ah, it's okay. Uh, but <laughs> we are going to use statistics, but the answer is much more prosaic than you think. So it's not heavy mathematical model. It's much, much more stupid than you can imagine. Life is amazingly, uh, I don't know what's correct word here. Uh, so this is 2014 election in Syria, and this data not hidden, it's data written on Wikipedia, which you can open now. So uh, in total, there were 11,063,000 6, 
634,000 people, and they hit from you the last three digits. So uh, can somebody please uh, suggest me uh, the last three digits? Just on the run. 11634. Three digits, please. Yes. Three to one. Perfect random choice. Okay. And now the winner of the election was Bashar Assad, who got 10 million votes. So can somebody take the calculator? I need help. Prepare a calculator. 10 million, uh, 319. And I need three last digits. Yeah, please, three last digits. Say, please, three last digits. What? Any help? Five or six, okay. Now we have to divide this number by this number to know what, what the percentage of votes. So who has calculator? Please take this number, divide by that number. Eighty-eight point six. What else here? Okay. So this is a number. Yeah. So uh, when we randomly, uh, so the point that this numbers here. Uh, completely depend on this choice and can be random. Uh, now, by the way, we are still kind of lucky to get tonight. But then we have 168. Now you actually take correct numbers from elections, I mean, declared number from elections. Let us see. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is probability for this event to happen. I mean, you don't need to do much statistics, right? I mean, so I'm I, very clear how the, the numbers for photos were written down, right? I, I mean, just imagine, so people just falsify things and they do not even try to not put zeros in the expected uh, percentage. And this happens not only in this election, but there are other examples which I skip, but you can find them on the links. But let's do just a little bit more scientific. So this is a uh, turnout. First of all, this is a uh, uh, comparison statistics from countries where elections were declared as honest. So it's turnout uh, in different elections worldwide. So for instance, this is uh, Mexico. So this is very close to Gaussian distribution. And this is percentage of voters. And uh, for instance, at mo most uh, so 5,000 election staple station had 40% uh, uh, time. So there are some, sometimes people like to go more. This, this thing is actually Sweden. Uh, it's a little bit not Gaussian, but they're closing to 100%. So Swedish are very responsible people. Uh, so don't, don't, don't take pay attention to this 100%. It's like uh, it's jail, army, hospital, so there typically everybody votes, right? So this is, can be actually completely correct numbers, but just it's not standard statistics. But everything else is, so this is different countries, uh, election from 2009 to 2011. Uh, so these are uh, Russian election for parliament 2016 and president 2018. So this is how many people came up. So there's a peak around 35% and uh, for a president elect on about 60%. And it doesn't go down. It actually stayed constant and increases we come to 100%. So let's, com let's compare. So peak and down. Peak stays. 
Uh, there is also correlation about who was winning and this, uh, but I do not show it. I want to show something different. There are also other peaks here. And this peak happens at 95, 90, 85. And this actually, uh, uh, how many percentages vote for the winner? There is peak at 95, 90, 85. So it's a clear peaks in the distribution. So it's not just, you know, you know in, in, in particle physics it's called resonance. That's how people detect Higgs boson with five sigma probability. I, I mean, just ask the experiment, that's what they're doing. Let's do be very scientific. Let's take this thing and make Fourier analysis. So difference between peaks at one percent is very popular and at half of percent is also very popular. This is done by Fourier analysis. This is very clear because you do not need to even to see with your eyes what is happening with this. Yeah. So this is, uh, there are more examples. I will skip uh, for these lectures. Let us come back to, to nature. Um, uh, I'm going wrong direction. So now we will speak about laws of large numbers in nature. So in nature, things are more difficult because there are interactions. So if you ignore interactions, well, the only thing we can get is gas, ideal gas. And it's kind of dull part of nature. Uh, but even after include interactions, there's still many universal properties. Uh, and the most exciting one uh, is temperature and entropy. Statistical physics and nature, the quantity is temperature and entropy. There is also pressure and volume, but this is kind of mechanical things. This is nothing new. What we're going to speak about a lot about entropy and temperature, but we're going to do this after the break. Before the break, a uh, few minutes to run over uh, amazing properties of nature. It's still be not really the topic of today's lecture. It's announcement what we plan to do in Uppsala in three week time. So in three week times, we want to do nice condensed matter presentation with everything beautiful which can happen. And this is kind of uh, appetizer only, just coming through to us fast. So, uh, so first of all, ancient Greeks believe there are four things. There are much more phases even for the same chemical component. So standard example, we have carbon, diamond, carbon graphene. Depending on pressure and temperature, you have different phases. So there are more than liquid vapor and solid. There are different types of solid, for instance. And actually uh, for carbon, it's much more beautiful. We have uh, fuller ends, uh, we have nanotubes, we have uh, graphene, we have graphite and diamond. So of course, gra carbon is perfect. Carbon is based on life and it's got a lot of flexibility from different bonds. Well, the organic creatures, we have different example of how nature can organize, right? It's even more interesting. Uh, but let's take something which is less exotic, uh, I mean, less uh, valent than uh, carbon, uh, oxygen, uh, just take water. There are still 19, 19, not three, not four, 19 different states of ice. So here you have already see only four, but there are 19. And uh, they, uh, how it depends on, on conditions, how they're created. Uh, uh, just four examples. They can form hexagonal axes, they can form uh, cubic lattices, rhombohedral velocities, tetrahedral lattices, and there's only four of them, 19. Uh, there are, it's not even here, there are more than 80 different types of snowflakes. So there are some nice pictures. The Dendrit snowflake, uh, well, I, I don't know how did it this one. Triangular snowflakes, uh, 12 branch snowflakes and uh, some other. Well, uh, it's a, I think it's beautiful physics. Uh, I, I wonder if, uh, I wish to have a professional who told more. Uh, so nature shows a lot of organization, but you know, uh, this organization, uh, so we discuss a lot about cows coming from deterministic behavior. It's like cows from order. Now we try to speak about order from cows, but compared to how many molecules inside, it's like 
it's kind of order at very huge price, right? It's, but still it's order. Now the question, uh, do we need complex rules? Like ancient Greek believes, uh, ancient Greek will say, say that um, there will be a dendrites elemental snow, element of snowflakes that will be triangular elemental thing for snowflake and so on, right? And we know it's the same molecule of water. Do we actually need complicated rules to create diversity? And the answer is no. And this is, can be done shown in, on computer experiments. So this cellular automaton games, the most famous uh, converger game of life. I want to show it. It's, it's again something which we liked a lot when I was a student, uh, but it's still popular these days. So first of all, uh, we live on a square grid and the rules are following. If, uh, guy in the center has no neighbors or one neighbor, it's a dice and becomes empty, dice of solitude. If it has uh, four or five neighbors, it will lose four or more neighbors that will die because lack of resources. If it has uh, two or three neighbors, it will leave. It's a stable configuration. And if it has exactly three neighbors, then uh, empty cell if it has exactly three neighbors and it's, uh, possibility to, to, to make a new life. So this is a development rule. So every time you look at each cell and apply these rules. So that's it, no more rules. And uh, the point that people, uh, so it's was proven that it's complete Turing machine. It's, I mean, if it's Turing machine, you can do everything, right? Uh, this is final outcome, but how beautiful the outcome is worth looking. So first of all, something simple. Um, so following these rules, we have this spacecraft flowing, uh, living trail. Okay, and there are a lot of games of this type. There is concept of speed of light and travel. Speed of life is one cell per second per turn. And every spacecraft has speed of light and this competition who will be the fastest of given size and so on. Okay, uh, I recorded two more videos for you because they're nice, but the online you can sign much more. So this one, let's just look. Okay, and this one, and after that we go to the break. It's a simple system that is capable to reproduce itself on a larger scale. Okay, let's have a break. Uh, so uh, I think uh, 15 past seven. So let me make an announcement what will happen after the break. After the break will be the heart of statistical physics, entropy. So chaos again, but this time's entropy chaos. Like honest entropy, how we know it in theoretical physics. And I hope to finish with black holes, but uh, let's see how it goes. So we meet at a quarter past seven, and now we have a quarter break. Mm. Right. It's 16 minutes. Um, so we continue. And um, the question, 
I will start the discussion now is about the following. Uh, so you saw this uh, super amazing complexity that you can uh, do in the game of life. However, <clears throat> you have to realize that it is highly sophisticated arrangements of points done by humans because they want to achieve certain effect. If you randomly put points on the grid of life of this game, well, you will get some random thing, which is not particularly illuminating. It will be no serious coordinated behavior. It will be just random stuff. Uh, so the question uh, what it takes humans or like humans assistant by computers uh, to controllably uh, manipulate, let's say matter or whatever they want to manipulate because we started from the statement that we cannot manipulate but kind of we come back to be optimistic and say, okay, let, let, let's try, but what will it take us? Assuming at least we can overcome problems of cows, what does it take us? And then uh, first I would like to ask a question. So Lina, can you answer a question, please? Uh, so please come here. So I have, uh, you, you, everybody can hear you here. So, uh, do you watch cartoons? Yes. Yeah. What is your favorite cartoon? I don't know. Is it a cartoon exists? I don't know. Okay, but but pick one, pick one. Stylish matter. What? Stylish matter. <laughs> Oh, okay, I, I have to understand it at home. It's something new. So, um, is it a cartoon or a film? Cartoon. Huh? Cartoon. Okay, and how do you think this cartoon was made? I don't know. So, Ryan, do, do you know how it was made? Some cameraman who uh, who uh, started a YouTube channel with the, his daughter, and uh, they're doing all kinds of crazy challenges. Okay, okay. So actually, it's, it's a YouTube channel. Okay. Uh, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but the point that any, any modern entertainment is, is passing through computers, and computers are as uh, well. You know what it is. So the point is that uh, computers are just binary code eventually. And uh, in order to manipulate matter, eventually we come to the point that we have to uh, have information about what we are going to manipulate. This is the most essential part. And information can be stored using binary code. This is the standard uh, for today. Uh, and uh, let's remind ourselves what is binary code. Well, binary code is just a, a, a word written from zeros and one. So we have a word with only, word with only one letter. And uh, it can uh, distinguish between two possible states, let's call it zero and one. And the amount of information associated with this word has a name, it's called one bit. So information is measured in the length of the word you need uh, to encode this information. So, uh, one letter word has one bit of information coming with it. Not surprisingly, two letter word has two bits of information and it can encode four states. By the way, it's again Pascal uh, tri triangle almost happening. Uh, three letter word, has three bits, it has eight. So every time I multiply by a factor of two. Uh, a little bit more fun comes at four bits because at four bits we have 16 elements. Uh, 16 options, and using 16 options, we can already encode uh, 10 numbers. So it is enough to encode numbers that we use in everyday life, but we have more space, and usually people encode uh, 16 numbers, and they use hexadecimal codes, the standard code to use in programming languages. Uh, yeah, so from zero to, to nine, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, it's now denoting 
denoting uh, numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So it's 16 distinct numbers, uh, which can be decoded by four bits and some movie story time. Uh, it's Martian, Mark Watney on the Mars, stranded. So he, he uh, first he tried binary channel of communication. He posed a question here, and this is and this this camera can turn right to left to say yes or no. Uh, well, yes or no. But then this was kind of super slow. And instead, because camera can rotate 360 degrees, he made 16 sectors and use hexadecimal code to communicate with Earth in this way. Um, and then they he used uh, ASCII two tables to decode to what they are saying, which is ASCII two table is uh, eight bits uh, encoding, so two times uh, two hex uh, code uh, characters. Well, eight bits is one byte, a standard unit in, in, in computer. I still remember times which counting the amount of bytes was important. It was kind of a very uh, important resource which you could, could not spare easily. Now it's far from the case, but there are 256 possibilities. And this you know very well when you do RGB coding. So you have one uh, byte per red channel, one byte for green channel, one byte for blue channel. I don't know, well, I cannot see it on the screen, but here you see like the maximum number 255, the minimum is zero. So 256 possibilities. And actually this is hex code. Uh, usually you also, you do, do not like number three, like number four, you want to add four bytes together. So fourth byte will be opposite to alpha channel. This is also quite standard. And this is uh, how you encode colors. Um, so this is basics of, of, uh, of uh, storing uh, information in computer, uh, just some numbers which follows. One kilobyte is two to the power 10 bytes, which is two to the power 13 bits. And number of possibilities uh, coming from this formula, two to the power n, when n is number of bits, and this is actually enormous number. Yeah, that's many possibilities you can store in one kilobyte. It's, it's, it's a lot of possibilities. But you have to understand that it's a lot of uh, not very useful possibilities as well. So it's completely random stuff happening. And uh, finally, whether computer can help us to simulate matter like this high precision, even we will be completely omnipotent. Uh, well, one gram of matter is about 10 to the power of 23 or at least 22 atoms. And one terabyte is 10 to the power of 15 bytes. Uh, well, I, I mean, it's clearly incompatible. Yeah. So if you, even if you take the, the whole uh, computer, you still cannot describe one gram of matter normally. So, and, and a number of possibilities you have to treat. I mean, it's, it's not even astro astronomical, it's not even cosmological, it's more. Um, so no, I don't hope you really can control matter, all of it, but at least uh, let us make less pretentious uh, goal and let's control at least a little bit, a little bit of matter, small quantities like microscopic, maybe then we can. And the question which we are going to discuss is uh, what information uh, can we offer to control this matter? This is the main point for this afternoon, well, second part of the lecture. Uh, information needed to control. Um, so the first thing to note is that when we uh, communicate with information, there are always possibility for errors when we operate with information. For instance, transmit to, to somebody else, errors can happen. This is part of life. And for these reasons, you do not barely send code. You send code with some safety uh, margin. And for instance, uh, you, you, there are some something what is called check digits. So those who in Sweden know that something called personal number. So it's here. So the first six digits is year of birth, month of birth, and day of birth. So 19th December 2000, uh, a girl was born. Girl because this number is even. This is actually uh, girls are even numbers and uh, boys are odd numbers. But only these three digits are, uh, are, are relevant. The last digit, number four, is actually a control digit. It's, control using, it's computed using certain procedure. 
uh, which is written here, which you will not explain, doesn't matter. The point that it's fully fixed by all the other numbers. And uh, when you submit your personal code to computer system, if computer system was designed properly, it checks this last digit and if it was a mistake, it tells the number is wrong, please check. And that's very good control, of course. Uh, let us, but this, this is basic control thing. It tells you there is mistake, but it cannot identify what mistake was. Uh, most of your thing is to make self-correcting codes. So codes that are capable to correct, detect mistakes and correct them. Let, let me give you an example how it works. So suppose we want to send four bits. So four bits of, uh, of information, like say, one, zero, one, one for instance. And then we know that this is a pretty good probability that one digit will happen to be wrong on transmission, not to one. Then we want to protect our signal. So one thing possible to do will generate a much longer sequence. Uh, so this is four times uh, three, it's 12 digits. So uh, this one here will repeat it three times. It will be one, one, one. Then it will be zero, 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 one, 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 one. So what we're doing, we just duplicate an information. Then if one bit uh, flips like this one, we can clearly see that it was wrong because it should be three the same numbers and one is uh, not correct. When two the same numbers, one incorrect, you'd never know which is incorrect. But when it's three the same, one is incorrect, you know which was incorrect. It's like you ha should have three, uh, three devices on, on, on a ship uh, when you travel, like so, so three timers to know what time is correct not two, but three. And then you say, okay, this was incorrect, we will correct it. And then uh, we receive uh, happily our information. So this is an idea. You increase lungs of the system and have a routine to check if mistakes happen. But this is clearly, uh, well, clearly do not know, but for sure I will show it also you now that it is a very inoptimal way to, to secure yourself. So to send four bits, you were using 12 bits. Four of them was useful, everything else is your own security. And the only thing you can do is to find one mistake. Actually, I can find one mistake by using only nine bits and it's still very simple. So what I can do, I can duplicate each of bits. So it's like one, one, zero, zero, one, 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 coming from these numbers, not tripling, but doubling. And then I use one more digit, which, which count total parity. So the three ones, one zero, so sum is three, so it's odd number, so we'll put here one. If this number were even, I would put here zero. Okay. So now, if for instance, this zero flipped, um, I know that total parity should be odd, so hence said zero who is wrong here, not. So, I mean, this, this part is definitely defective because they're different, but I know that zero is wrong because it corresponds to wrong parity. So I will correct zero to one and find that word. And if it's parity division who was corrupted, then it clearly doesn't correspond to the parity of the code. And I know that parity digit was corrupted. I also can correct it. So I, I succeeded to do the same job with the same problematics uh, by do, using only nine digits. And well, you probably can guess what is the game, how many digits in minimal do you need to accomplish the job? Well, for sending four bits of information, the answer is uh, humming seven four code. So uh, you need seven bits of information to send four bits of useful data and being able to correct one bit error. So what you're doing, so D1, D2, D3, D4 are useful bits of data. And P1, P2, P3 are, are con control bits. So P2, for instance, is a parity of these three guys together. P3 is parity of these three guys together and so on. Uh, it's like, uh, so here I had uh, one parity check. The idea you can make more sophisticated parity checks uh, with three different subsets. And the statement that using these seven bits, you can always identify one mistake, not nine, seven. And if you do uh, one more big parity check, then actually you can uh, uh, correct one bit mistakes and identify any two bit mistakes. You cannot correct them, but you can identify them. 
uh, Hamming code uh, is one of the first uh, self-correcting code which was invented in the, in the era of development of, of uh, informatic uh, technology. Well, now people have much more big series, a long, interesting story about coding. Uh, for instance, when we communicate with Voyager far in the space, we actually use certain self-correcting code protocols to communicate and receive information from out of, uh, skirts, out of skirts of your of, uh, solar system. That's how it works. Uh, okay, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the question uh, that we want to ask in the story, given a noisy channel, that means a channel which can have mistakes in it, what is the best possible amount of information that you can transmit? Uh, the answer is given by Shannon Terry. Uh, so if P is the probability for any bit to be flipped to the opposite, so it's noise, so P is the probability of noise to happen, uh, then you can reliably, I mean with certitude, transmit uh, that many bits of information by this formula. So let me explain with this formula. So N is total number of bits that you transmit in your signal. So in this case, it's 12, okay? S is Shannon entropy, that's what I'm going to define now. And this difference between total number of bits and entropy is actually amount of information that you can reliably transmit and be sure that you're right. There is one condition, uh, this n should be large. And this is low of large numbers. Just exactly in the same way it was described in the first. You need that standard deviation is small. And I know that there are quite a few physicists uh, listening. So I can tell you quickly uh, what you are doing. You do multinomial expansion, you do Stirling approximation, you do Lagrange multiply, you are done. So it's super easy as you are doing in so many exercises at university. So I just a few lines and uh, if you know this, this techniques, it's very fast to prove this error. Uh, okay, but anyway, important quantity which I want to focus is Shannon entropy. So uh, you see this is a minus. It means that uh, if, if, if entropy is zero, this means that we can use all, all bits that we have to transmit information. It's the best, uh, it's the best we can do. But uh, this, is, this is not zero, of course, if you have noise. And this is a formula. So n is number of bits and we have p as a probability, p log p plus y minus p log one minus p. Well, it's not too complicated, but maybe if you give it two logs for some time, you do not recognize immediately what it does. So this is a plot. So entropy, Shannon entropy is a function of probability of noise. When probability of noise is zero, this means there is no noise. You, you are safe to transmit all bits of useful information. So entropy should be zero. When probability is one half, entropy is maximal and is equal to n. Well, it's obvious because if it's one half probability of heavy noise, then you have no idea what happening to your signal at all. Like every bit can be corrupted, 50%. Interestingly, if you have probability more than one half, entropy decreases because what's happening, that noise is almost certainly will happen, it will flip your bits. If probability is one, it means that all the bits will be reversed. Well, but then you know they're all reversed. You can get information, no problem. And you again can receive all the information. Uh, so this is a formula, and of course the point is, this is called entropy. It's not uh, physics entropy, it's information entropy, but formula is the same, and this is what I'm going to show you now. So for binary system, we have two options, zero or one, and one has probability P and uh, zero have probability Q. Sum of probabilities is one. And formula for Shannon entropy is this one. I just rewrote transparency for previous uh, formula, just slightly different. You see, it's P log P plus Q log Q. What you have many components? Well, PI will be probability to be in state I if you have many components, like, like in, 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 in a physical system, you have zillions of components, which has some probability to happen. Uh, but sum of probability should be equal to one and double is number of components. It's called statistical weight. And then Shannon entropy will be this formula. It's again, P log P, sum of all possibilities of P log P. Nothing, it's just repetition, just for many components. And if all components are all probable, that means it's P is always the same. So it should be one over double, right? 
if W is number of possibilities, then what will be W is probability of each possibility if they're equally probable. And if P is equal to W, it's not difficult to see that the formula simplifies here. It's logarithm of statistical weight of the system. So this is Boltzmann. It is not just Boltzmann, it's his grave. And, uh, and this is a formula, S equal K log W. Um, uh, so uh, kind of uh, everybody would like to say, say that Boltzmann died or he committed suicide. This, this, this is kind of, I think it is confirmed that he committed suicide, but then there is a story he would upset because nobody believed him. This, this I'm not sure about though. Because there are people who believed him, there are people who did not believe for sure. Uh, I think life is a little bit more complicated. Uh, but, well, I, did, I do not know Boltzmann personally. I will not believe the story, but also do not know what happened for sure. But this is kind of a story which is obviously will be popular that Boltzmann told it should be like that. Nobody believed he killed himself. Right. Uh, so Boltzmann is the father of statistical physics. Uh, and remember by the beginning of my talk today, we were in the times when people did not yet believe in it was seriously. People actually, some people thought about this Greek approach about elements in Greek's version of it. And uh, idea that we have this atoms around and moreover entropy, entropy people already knew, second law of thermodynamics, so people already did it. Industrial revolution did happen. People understood how to build heat engines to run trains. People knew what is entropy by that time. Carnot engine was there. Uh, but the fact that entropy is a logarithm of possible configurations of atoms, it was crazy by that period of, of time. Moreover, Planck, and this is the, the guy uh, who in 1900, like this year, 1900, exact in December, he, in German society, he showed his formula for, for black body radiation. This is called birth of quantum mechanics. It's, I think it's 19 December, it's kind of a holiday. Uh, we have Planck constant. Planck started to work on the problem because uh, he actually did not believe Boltzmann. Uh, I'm not sure what he believed for sure, but uh, he kind of, so was, there, was a, uh, there was a debate whether second law of thermodynamics is fundamental law of nature or derived. And Boltzmann is derived. It's actually called S is equal to log of W. And many people believe it's fundamental. Planck is, to, to, as far as I read a little bit, seems to believe that it was fundamental and eventually concluded that not by, well, okay. Uh, so this was very hot times in, 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 in physics, but okay, but let's come to second law. For the sake of today, uh, we will formulate it in this way. Entropy of the closed system increases its time. So why it was important historically? Be not because of this statement, because it said that perpetual mobility of second kind is impossible. Uh, people tried to make get energy from nothing. So what is perpetual mobility of second kind? Uh, you, you have a body. This body contains huge energy because atoms uh, running there, well, it's not, it's here, it's not as huge, but if it were gas, it will be huge energy. Uh, it's still a lot, uh, quite a lot. So in gas, uh, if this is a gas, uh, molecules running like crazy. And if you're just able to synchronize movement of molecules, you can actually run uh, cars. Uh, energy of them. The point you cannot synchronize them. And this is what second law tells you. If they are already chaotic, they are chaotic. It's done. You cannot undo it. Uh, so this is why it was important historically. Uh, you cannot uh, draw useful, uh, useful, um, what useful is important, useful energy from just uh, something that is there. You need uh, uh, this uh, engine which have throw energy from hot body to the cold body and the process you get some, some uh, work done. Uh, the second word is about this, uh, but uh, from the point of view of information, let, let us speak about information. So this is Shannon formula again. So uh, N is a maximal information that you can have about your system. 
it can be code, it can be real physical system. I is a useful information that you can, useful in the sense that you can use it to make something in your life, right? And S is entropy, it's uh, exactly which is noise, which is uh, like reducing maximum information to smaller amount of useful. So second law says that entropy always increases, and it means that this time we lose information, information about the system, and unfortunately, irreversibly, we cannot get it back. And uh, eventually, we, less information means less control of the system. That's what it is from the point of view of information. And now you probably better feel why entropy means, uh, increase of entropy means increase of chaos, because we decrease our amount of possibility to control. Um, so there was a very important argument against uh, second law of thermodynamics. And this argument was uh, argument of time reversal. All fundamental laws of classical mechanics, at least what we speak about classical mechanics, are time reversing. That means uh, that if you have predictions that something will increase, by reversing of time, you will have predictions that something is decreasing. So second law is against uh, uh, direction, is against reversibility of time in classical mechanics. And in fact, there is an experiment from 1950, which is called Spin Echo, which actually did it. The idea is very simple. Uh, for the gas, it's much easier to see. Uh, so this is our uh, molecules that we are trying to follow. Uh, they make it. Now imagine at some moment of time, somebody reverse all uh, velocities to the opposite one. Then by classical laws of motion, they undo exactly evolution and eventually, eventually, eventually come to state of low entropy, very ordered state. So, so we can always do this argument because all laws of motion are reversible. Just change speed. Of course, change speed of uh, atoms in gas is very hard to achieve, but a change in uh, orientation of spin is possible by sending very special impulses. Uh, so this is uh, some spins directed in some direction. Then by some first impulse, rotate them 90 degrees. And, and system is such that when they rotate 90 degrees, they start to have some quotic behavior. And now they disordered, entropy increased. But then you send uh, pulse, which what is that does, it just rotates them to opposite direction, basically 180 degree rotation. And after that, It's again ordered system. So this is explicit experiment that was done. And in this moment of time, very shortly, entropy has decreased. Yeah. Notice that it will increase after it decreases, it will increase again. So it's not forever, just for a short amount of time. So this time reversal was actually uh, not only conceptual, but experimentally confirmed argument against it. Um, so indeed, uh, second law uh, is, is, uh, is, is kind of wrong, but it's correct statistically. And this is what I, I will discuss now. So I also, yeah, it's here. I also fought in second law, yeah? Things tend to, to be lost. Um, uh, <laughs> Right, so I would like to explain to you second law. And there is a reason uh, for entropy to increase. And reason that we lose information because we actually not interested in all the details of the system. If we follow all the details, we will not lose information. Let me explain it. So full information about the system, really full, is one thing. But there is a thing we care about and things we do not care about. Uh, full information is position of atoms, velocity, is position of electrons, position of protons, a lot of other things. It's a huge, huge thing. We probably only care about velocities of atoms and only that. And everything else we ignore. And when we compute entropy, we compute entropy associated to velocity of, of electrons. Now, 
by the way, this modern fashionable word, which is called uh, entangled uh, entanglement entropy. But Boltzmann knew it. Uh, this is nothing new in the world in reality. So Boltzmann argument had used entanglement entropy already. Just did not call this name. Uh, so uh, the point that inf uh, the total information, if you really omnipotent didn't, will be preserved and entropy will never increase. If you have full information, entropy is zero. Remember it. Entropy is, is opposite to information. But what happens, useful information will flow in this direction and come here and effectively be losing information. It actually can also come back and we will see how it comes back and when. So last experiment on computer for today. Uh, so simulate this uh, using gas is quite hard. So we will use different model. It's theoretical, but it's easy to, to work with it. So let me explain how it works. So here we have uh, blues, uh, blue things are mirrors. And red thing is a beam of light. Beam of light coming from this point here. And when approach mirrors, it reflects. So this light will go here. And then it's periodic boundary condition to make it simple, coming here. Coming to this mirror, reflect from here, going around, reflects, going around. And we do the story until it's full cycle. So. Uh, on mathematical terms, the system is not fully ergodic. It doesn't pass through all possibilities, but it doesn't matter. Uh, light does some job here. Uh, so you understood the, the laws of movement, right? The laws is just is a beam of light which reflects on the mirrors. Mirrors will, uh, it's models for interaction with some particles, but it's what is called in physics mean field approximation. So it will be easier. Um, now, I will just increase size of my system. I, I want to use large laws of large numbers in practice. I will have a much bigger system and walls and mirrors, much more mirrors. So computer thinks a little bit, but it will be okay. Um, so now my system is much, much bigger. Okay. It's a lot of mirrors, a lot of scattering of light happening. Uh, yeah, quite a bit. So the point actually uh, 16,000 cycles passes until light comes to its original point. 16,000. 16,000 is a big number. Well, not, not age of universe, but not, not, not 10 as well. And now I will create in different position of this lattice, many particles, many, many light beams. After 16,000 iterations, all of them will come to initial position. This is important in this system. The system is finite. Eventually they will come to original position after 16,000 cycles. And this is here. So here I create particle evolution. Uh, and this particle evolution tells uh, what happens with direction of light. One means it's forward north, Two means it's forward uh, east, three means it goes south, and four means west. So first it was north, then it's reflected, started to go east, then reflected again, started to go south, then it started to go uh, west, and, and so on. So there are 16,000 numbers, and we will follow. Now, this is exactly the point. We do not follow position of light beam at this moment of time. We only follow its direction. This is exactly why we care only about part of information. And now I will create 200 light beams. And uh, I will compute entropy associated to direction of, of light. And uh, maximal possible entropy is log four. So I divide by log four, so maximal is one, just four. So the statement is the following. System from zero to 16,000 after 600 repeats itself. All the time, all the time, entropy is just maximal and just fluctuating around maximum. Entropy is maximal and fluctuating. 
Do we see any increase of entropy? No. Entropy is maximal and it stays like this for almost time. Out 16,000 seconds, there will be 100 seconds when we started from ordered state. I intentionally put all the light beams going north. I did it with experimentalist. And entropy where everybody goes north, of course, zero. We have full information where light is going. And during the first 100 seconds, entropy increased. This is second law of thermodynamics. I can reproduce it using so its own differential equations like uh, physical kinetics tells me. I can, I can, I can, uh, this, this is actually exponential curve. Uh, you can fit it. And what will happen during the last 100 seconds? Light go to original position. It's also all ordered. You know what will happen during the last 100 seconds? Entropy will decrease. <clears throat> I will slightly simplify. Um, if I will start doing details, I will lose you anyway. But if you want, we can speak after the break, uh, after it's finished. Uh, uh, the point that if you randomly choose your state, entropy will be not increasing or decreasing until the already maximum. It increases only because you as experimentalist created state of low entropy, and then this most probable course of event for its increase. There is as many options for it to decrease, but it's just very hard to create these options. And uh, uh, what you need to do, you have to wait for the lifetime of the universe before it will happen. If, if system is periodic in time, of course. If system is not periodic, it will happen never. It will be different branch of evolution of universe when it will be always maximal eventually decrease. And here uh, comes concept of error of time. Uh, well, laws of motion are reversible. Uh, laws of motions are reversible, uh, but we cannot go in the past. We can only go in future. Why? So it's a hard question. Nobody knows good answer, but there is answer from second law of thermodynamics. Uh, we perceive direction of time in the direction where entropy increases. It increases because we actually in this state of system when it should increase. Well, this is called error of time. Uh, it doesn't mean that you solve the problem, uh, but at least it's some comforting explanation, maybe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I thought I will derive these uh, formulas, but I think uh, I will not. I just will state it. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make two statements uh, on the blackboard, but I will just say them without derivation. Um, <clears throat> statement number one is that um, controlling particles, uh, the question, okay, we have problem with entropy, we have problems with information, a lot of things to do, but suppose we have only a few particles. Can we control them? Can we effectively control them? That means can we spend less effort to control them that actually these particles do useful work? And the answer is, is actually bad for us. To control one particle, we, can, we should spend as much energy uh, as we can get out of a particle. So uh, perpetual mobility doesn't work even on the microscopic level. As this explanation about maximum demo. And the second thing I wanted to speak about, but it'll stay as a result only, is a question, uh, how much information can we store uh, in any device? So the question is the following, like we always make it smaller and smaller size of the system to store more information. So we have flash drive, which contain gigabytes of data, whereas 50 years ago, it was uh, one big thing, which contained only kilobyte, right? It's big progress, but how much can we compactify this time? Uh, we're still far away from that, but there is theoretical bound from theoretical physics. It's called Bekenstein bound. Uh, it, tells you that you cannot uh, store more information is that something which is proportional to area 
uh, surrounding uh, your volume. So the question is the following, how much information can you store in a given volume if you have super uh, advanced technology? So there is some coefficient of proportionality. Here it's Boltzmann constant, this is called Planck length. But important that it multiplies not volume in which you're going to store information by its area. And this thing is called uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And the idea is the following uh, storing information requires energy. If you pump too much energy uh, to your volume, then by Einstein formula it becomes too massive. And too massive in a small volume, it's a black hole. The moment you have a black hole, you cannot pump there more while maintaining size. If you pump more to the black hole, the black hole grows. So uh, this is a maximal amount you can store before it becomes black hole. After it becomes black hole, it's a problem to get out information. Uh, but then interesting conclusion comes that uh, everything we know about uh, this world can be stored using some other uh, technology on its boundary. And this come idea for holography, that uh, our world is projection from boundary of this world, which is quite crazy, but it has a lot of useful technical benefits for modern science. Um, so this I wanted to tell you, we can speak more after uh, lecture finish. And to, I want to finish with some summary, which comes back uh, to this nice file. So this is fire is my brasa, my brasa, uh, which is uh, Swedish uh, celebration of spring coming. In Sweden, spring comes for Zoom people. In Sweden, spring comes in May, and this is I confirm I lived here for a few years. It's not April and not March. Uh, so they celebrated on the uh, on 30th of April, and I just wanted to tell you uh, the following thing. So everybody so. It's, Everybody can look on fire. It's like eternal, enjoyable thing to look on fire. Uh, what a physicist thinks when physicists look on fire. First of all, of course, I enjoy looking on fire as it is fire because it's it just, it's, it's just nice, aesthetically nice. And of course it can be just that, it can be a meditative look. But also uh, I, 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 I remember what Greeks thought about fire. And uh, I understand uh, what's fire in reality. Um, I remember how they think about the states of matter and how it's different in reality. Then I remember uh, that uh, fire is burning of carbon and carbon is created in the sun. And uh, there is a very nice story about how it's created. Also, what I remember immediately is why fire is red, because uh, red color of fire is the color of thermal radiation, the same one which was explained by Planck, and the same one which is in the sky uh, coming from the uh, origin of our universe. Um, so uh, this is uh, very few things uh, immediately comes to the mind. There is one more, it's about uh, my brass itself. We celebrate the beginning of spring and uh, spring uh, happens uh, every year with good periodicity. It's coming from the fact that the earth is stably rotated around the sun. Uh, as I discussed in the, in the first half of the lecture, Actually, we should expect the opposite, that most of the systems are chaotic. And of course, there are meteorites, there is Jupiter and other planets that influence the orbit of Earth. And what we saw in Lawrence attractor, that small perturbation can destabilize system completely. Orbit of Earth is stable. Why? And there is nice mathematical explanation about it. It's called uh, kolmogorov halnut morenser theorem. Uh, which related to the fact that uh, system is integrable. Uh, so it's very rare situation. If uh, Newton potential was not one over distance, but any other power, just 1.01, uh, well, it's a little bit exaggeration, a little bit more, uh, then orbit of Earth will be unstable. If it will be unstable, there will be no seasons and there will be no life as you know it now. So, uh, in reality, when you understand how all things are connected uh, from origin of carbon to born there, 
to stability of Earth, uh, to, yeah. to radiation, which connects to the history of universe. And just how we explain matter using statistical physics. Well, looking on fire makes complete different sense. And we understand how physics is connected all together. And that's what I want to tell you. That's why we make adventures. Uh, it's only, only part of it. Uh, I don't have uh, the slides. Ah, it's Jeff, oh, sorry. It was when it was fire. Our adventure will continue. Uh, next week, we'll speak, uh, Sasha will speak about special relativity. It's when you travel in space with very high speed. It's again, completely different perception and experience. And uh, in two week times, uh, 20th of May, uh, we will meet in Uppsala and speak about waves well, and this light in particular. Uh, another will be lecture, not me and his experimentalist. So you'll see much more interesting images. So you're welcome to these lectures and our adventure continues. And I would like again to thank to everybody who contributed to preparation. And uh, thank you for your attention. This is a good time now to discuss anything. If you have any questions, you can ask Tim. He will reply. Uh, technical question. When you show the mathematical code with the mirrors and the light, how you were computing the entropy, just in a few words. There are four possible ways for the light to propagate, north, east, west, and south. So there are four possible states. Then I have 200 particles. And I compute probability of going north as number of particles going north divided by 200. And the same for all directions. And I just sum over I being this is entropy. Yeah. So I create 200 particles. First, they all go in the same direction, but because their position was different, they will scatter in different ways. Yeah. This, by the way, corresponds to what is called Boltzmann molecular chaos uh, hypothesis, when Boltzmann derived uh, his formula for increase of entropy, it's called H theorem. He used molecular chaos hypothesis, and this actually mimics uh, this hypothesis. And a different point of space, uh, light will scatter in different ways, and we have no control of it. So this is practically how it's done. I have 200 particles. I compute number of particles going up in a given moment. It's probability. And there's some overall four options. Yes. Um, so uh, you talked about uh, how finite systems have to like repeat or something. Yes. Uh, so I think is this related to? I think there's some kind of theorem in group theory or something which deals with this kind of, which is that. Um, so every element um, kind of has to or in a finite group, like every element has to have a, um, every element, there is an exponent uh, such that 
um, if you raise uh, any elements to, to that exponent, it has to become equal to the identity. Yes, yes. So is this? It's the same thing. And I so, so system is very, very simple. Uh, if you have finite number of possibilities and your system uh, has uh, a unitary evolution, which means that uh, if you at a given point, you have only one way to go. And if you went there, you know from where you come. Then if you have finite number of points you're passing through, so you're passing through number of finite points, every time you go into a new point, every time you go a new point, but eventually number of points where you can come finishes because it's finite and you have to come back. That's that simple. Yeah. May I ask a question maybe? Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, basically if we uh, wait long enough, then uh, the system can come to its uh, origin uh, because, uh, uh, because you can calculate the trajectories exactly and uh, everything eventually comes uh, to where it should be. Yes. But uh, on the other hand, you also mentioned that there are systems <clears throat> which behave very differently, even if you change the initial conditions by a tiniest amount. Yes. So is it really the point where quantum mechanics comes into play? So because there are quantum things happening in our world, and they maybe change things slightly at every moment, then our that's why our world actually cannot really come back, even if we wait long enough. Well, OK. Uh, so uh, so I personally believe it's not the explanation. Uh, I believe it's enough to have classical explanation. Uh, indeed, I mean, if you have small fluctuation, which you have no control, you're already doomed to come back anyway. But I think we can explain this without going there. So one comment here that uh, it's only one of the possible trajectories in this universe. There are zillions other trajectories which have maximum entropy forever. They never become down. And if this, so what you're saying, if you have smallest fluctuation, you will go to this other forever and stay there. Well, yes, but I believe that you do not need this uh, assumption to prove things if you like be clever enough. No. Questions in the chat, so Sasha. Well, uh, there are 20 messages, so it's some other messages. Yeah, but, uh, these are no questions. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if there are no more questions, then uh, of course you are, you are free to chat with us uh, at, the, at the entrance if you want. And uh, otherwise, uh, let's meet next week. and. Uh, discuss what happens if we move too fast. So, see you.